so we can uh, record. <laughs> Great, I've got it. Yes. Um, COVID allowed me to think. Yeah, it uh, put a halt to, forced uh, a halt to many distractions. And this is uh, what I wrote about, so that I had some time to, to reflect upon this. With all its busyness and its difficulties um, that, in, that is involved with this extreme situation that we all face, um, it also put a stop to many, many other uh, things that I didn't necessarily choose to, to have in my life. And, um, and this is what caused me to, to write the, the blog that I wrote about. I'm not going to talk about that particular blog because if you want, you can uh, read uh, all the words. But what I'd like to speak about is what Sander indeed uh, uh, opened up on. And um, self-care for me um, often is spoken on as about as healthy food, exercise, meditation. Um, and I think these terms are terms of our modern world, modern society. These are quick solutions, if you like, going through the motions. But do they really mean self-care? I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, it's, in many cases, it, it is a quick solution. It's not necessarily something ingrained. In other cases, it's something that is within the culture that we didn't even have a choice of applying these practices. So I do rate kids to healthy eating. It's not that they self-care, that's what they're used to doing. Um, and that's what caused me to think about what is really self-care. Or things like communication, investing in relationships, in friendships, um, in nature, learning skills, uh, taking time for all moments. And for many, uh, this does not come naturally. Taking these the moments of deep, what I call deep self-care. It does not come naturally. How many here in this group, in this small group, feel that they apply self-care? You can pick up your hand. Sando picks up a finger. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so, and how many think feel that they do it successfully, fully? <clears throat> so, the the it's not easy. It's very very hard. I mean, and it's offered very easily, often around us. Very easily do this course or that course, take this diet, sign up for the gym. Uh, it's offered very easily as quick solution, but it takes hard. And my question is, why is it so hard? Because for many, and particularly for carers, no matter what type of carer you may be, I mean, I'm a humanitarian aid worker in my past, so it's a very obvious uh, carer, but most professions, even in corporate settings, when you manage uh, people, you should have some element of care in your work, but not to mention educators, um, uh, charities, uh, doctors, medical professions, therapy, alternative medicine, uh, trainers, coaches, all involve uh, deep self-care. For these people in particular, what is found in research, that when you ask them how compassionate are you towards others, if I ask you all, you would rate yourself relatively high. But when I ask you how compassionate are you towards yourself, how forgiving, how loving are you towards yourself, often what I get is very low rating and there's an extreme gap in the answers. And the question is why, why is it so hard? So first of all, it requires awareness and awareness requires us to stop. Now we don't want to stop only when we get smacked hitting a wall. Now we're not talking about an acute state of stopping. We don't need to break in order to be aware. We want to prevent that, but for that we need time to stop and be aware. And this is what I talk about in the blog, that COVID has created this space, forced, if you like, this space of stopping. 
and, and not stopping only as in one uh, location, one region, what we see in many places in the world, but the stop has been like a pulled handbrakes on the pace of the of our planet. So the energy that this creates is much bigger. And the social pressure, the social discussion that this creates is much wider and creates a wave of a, a place for talking about this, talking about this pause, this sudden pause button that was pressed. The space that opened up first opened up a level of awareness. And um, if you wanted it or if we didn't want it, but this awareness I see as a welcomed uh, thing. And that level was the first and most difficult thing to create, that, create that time to really reflect. We encourage to create it, not by force, we encourage to create it uh, more gently, but COVID forced it into our lives. The second level is admission. In order to apply self-care, it's not just to sign up to the gym, but to really admit why I need it. Why do I need to make that time? Why do I need to wake up early in the morning and sit and meditate? Why do I need to eat? Really deeply feel it and admit it after that level of awareness, as after I've gone through that level of awareness. And then discipline. So self-care is not a quick solution. It's extremely hard. It takes awareness, admission, discipline, dedication, commitment, deep commitment. And ultimately the hardest thing of it, the hardest step and the hardest choice to taking that leap into self-care is to let go of something else and to apply change into our lives. And we resist, we are creatures, that resist change. All living creatures, in theory, resist change. And there have been so many distractions and so many stimulations for us that we got accustomed to and so many times and not that we are, that bound us, that it's very difficult to apply this change, to decide on this change. And it's a cycle. It's not that the commitment comes before change. It's the whole, all these elements work together against the, the, the ultimate realization of self-care, Ex excuses, difficulties, um, uh, challenges, personal challenges, blocks in our awareness, all these act against deep self-care. And what we all know sitting in this group that once we take that leap of self-care of, of self and, and accept that change, welcome that change, it's light, it's not difficult, but we need to turn it into a habit. And that's difficult because it's all we often fall off that wagon. Yeah? And this is what I'm talking about. And this, this difficulty is often perceived as uh, in a way, as my, my own for me as an excuse is uh, this the feeling that I'm feeling selfish to really take that time away, to really stop, to really change uh, manners, especially when you live in a family unit, you know, with others. When I live alone, I'm free, I can, it's, it's easy, it's easier, yeah? I left size to consider others, but selfishness, when we talk about selfishness, we often think about others. It's, a, we have to have a contract. It doesn't have to be close family members. It can be also the environment or the society. And many, um, in many cases, um, self-care feels like selfishness. It, should, it often is mixed with self-preservation and so on and so forth, but it's mixed with uh, a level of selfishness. And in fact, in the end of the day, we say selfishness again, that feeling, that sensation of selfishness is again an excuse to not care for yourself to going back to the, uh, but if I do this, it will, um, I force this decision on my family, or I am not available to care for the others within the organization that I'm working in. I'm now not available. So what do they do without me? Mm. Um, how do I have the right to leave and the others do not have the right to leave? 
all these um, uh, answers to un oneself stop us from being there, in fact, for, for ourselves. And if I'm not there for myself, I cannot be for others at all. <clears throat> and that's the mixture of self-care and selfishness. But the challenge is that self-care is not what, what, what I'm saying is that self-care is not the quick solution. Yeah. Self-care is more than that. And what we see today um, is that self-care is much more talked about in its deeper level and is much more attended to um, in groups, in organizations, and in systems as a whole. We see that happening throughout uh, the, the discussions, the media, uh, in, uh, in dinner parties. This is a topic that research is talking about, that is looking into, that institutions are looking how to tackle. They're facing the, the, the weight of it and the social pressure to answer these questions. And they do that in many different ways because it's not a quick solution. And people are refusing the quick solution. They're demanding much more complicated solutions and much more uh, complex systems that will fit uh, and be tailored to whatever culture they, they work and live within. And this is a welcomed uh, thing in my, in, my, in my view on the side as a fly looking at what's going on in terms of self-care and this discussion. Okay. And I'm interested to hear what's your thoughts on this. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chamatal. Uh, it's very, very clear and, and compelling. And I, I'd like particularly this notion of finding excuses, you know, that, that, that are in the way and that, that you know, limit our self, limit our, limits our self care. Um, and so if, if, if I think that through then, then those people who care or who, you know, care for a lot of other people professionally or privately, they have more excuse to not take self care, right? That's basically what's right. the problem with, with, the, with, with care industries and with management, et cetera. Uh, because there's always somebody, you know, who depends on their care, at least that's, that's the, the mindset. So there's more excuse not to take self-care, right? That's what you say, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I'll give you an example. So uh, when you're working and uh, living in, in very harsh conditions as an aid worker, it's very extreme and it's very much an example that is very much in your face. You, you're taking time off or going even to have a shower when people don't have what to drink or, uh, or, or taking care of yourself doing having a therapy session with somebody abroad over the phone, uh, doing all these tools that are available to you, but they just do not feel appropriate and they feel like selfish tools that you do not want to apply. Mm -hmm. um, and when you don't, you, you can't function. So it's a, real, um, it's a real conflict that happens on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, and to unpack so you say awareness helps you to distinguish what is genuine care or genuine responsibility versus all the excuses that you make about yourself, right? Exactly. Like in my case, I have always a to-do list and I think that that's all terribly important, right? But I never ask myself, can I, you know, can I, you know, make the to-do list smaller or, or can I uh, wait with a lot of stuff? I always think they're urgent and important at the, at the moment and, uh, and my own self-care is less important, you know. So that conditioning I have to unpack and 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 and, and re reframe. And exactly that. Practice. It's a matter yeah. of. It's exactly the matter of uh, of suddenly looking at it from also from the social coming out of yourself really and looking in around you and feeling and looking at your responsibilities and at human dignity and you are also human and prioritizing what needs to happen and standing in front of people and you want to stand with dignity and, and they, so, so it's about, about balance, finding that balance and within that awareness. It's not that you need to do everything for yourself, but you need to do everything that you can operate and function um, in, a, in a healthy, respectful and dignified uh, manner for yourself and for the people around you. Somebody here picked up uh, um, their hand Please go ahead, just yeah, unmute I don't yourself. Know. And speak yeah, hi. Freely. 
Hello, my name is Maud. I work uh, with the ICRC, one foot in the ICRC, let's say. Uh, and I don't know if it's appropriate that I just jump in, but I, 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 please, thought, please. The, <laughs> I thought the the discussion was interesting and it triggered some thinking on my side. And yeah, I just wanted to share. So just when when we mediated earlier and you asked the difference between selfishness and self-care, for me, it was really about self, uh, self-care is really open and it shares, it actually ripples uh, it has a ripple effect with others, while selfishness is really greedy. And so for me, actually, mm-hmm. self-care is, is, is about others as well. And this excuse about, you know, I, I get your point, I work in the humanitarian sector, so I know how difficult it might be to, um, let's say, have access to things that the people you help don't have access to, and then you feel guilty about this. On the other hand, uh, I think uh, the way for me to go around that is to put myself in their shoes. And if I'm someone who doesn't have anything and I see someone else who has the possibility to have access to those things, I think they would, I would be mad at them if they don't take advantage of this possibility. Uh, So that's the way I I work around it. Having the chance of, and I had for a long time this this problem being from Switzerland and traveling around the world and and looking at other countries maybe with less possibilities, and I've, I would feel just guilty about, you know, the, the life that I live in Switzerland. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> and and in the end, uh, I I figured that if I don't take advantage of this, then I am I'm, I'm being a bit stupid because <laughs> others might w- would yeah. like to have that kind of life. Maybe so. That's that's my way around it. Yeah, thank um, you. Thank yeah. you more. yeah, thank you very much. I I like what you say, and also this ripple effect of self care. The self care doesn't necessarily have to be like small, you know. And uh, selfishness is, has this sort of smallness and greediness that I think it was very well articulated. And it reminds me of how Dan Siegel, who is a uh, psychiatrist who's on our faculty, he says self care is is really good as long as you keep the self big, you know, like the self is not like this small thing living in your chest, but self is your relationships, is the whole network of life um, around you. And and so self-care is like self-care for the big self, which includes the world. Uh, And that that I like uh, very much so, because uh, it's not like denying the reality of interconnectedness, but it is reaffirming the reality of interconnectedness. So thank you for sharing. Are there more people who'd like to share just reflections or, you know, personal experience of how you deal with this dilemma between self-care and, and selfishness or greediness? I'd love to hear from you. And also in other cultures that we, that because I know people here are from lots of different places. So how is it seen in other places, in other countries? And how is it dealt with? Because other perspectives. You can um, also just unmute yourself. So you don't need to signal uh, digitally. Um, and maybe another, yeah, go ahead. Yes, um, what really struck me in, in what you've been saying is that it all seems to come back to this feeling of, of guilt. And I have a feeling that guilt gets experienced differently in different cultures. Like I, I sense this feeling of guilt, maybe I'm wrong, or maybe Sanat can say something about that. But in India, I feel it a little bit less that you should not, you know, you don't have to feel guilty about everything. Uh, but I, I have a sense that this, this feeling of feeling selfish is very much connected to that. We immediately feel guilty when something is about ourselves. And, and, and I wonder, it's more like a wonder that what is the function of feeling guilty? Does it have any purpose at all? And why do we feel uh, guilty? And to explore that question a bit more deeply so that we can, it, may, it might dissolve because it's such an obstacle, isn't it? In a way, why do we f- spend so much time feeling guilty? Hmm. Yeah, so, so what you're saying, uh, Charlotte, is, is that, that in India, people feel less guilty as part of the culture, and whereas Europeans or Westerners have a stronger sense of guilt? 
which I, I was my experience too. Selfishness and guilt, guilty is very closely related. Yes. Yeah. But we'd say in India it's definitely less so. Yeah, it, it always strikes me that when I speak to like basically non-Indian people that this feeling of guilt comes up much more often. When I'm in India, I don't experience it so much. It's like you do it or you don't do it, but you know, that feeling of guilt doesn't have any purpose at all. <laughs> it sounds a bit simplistic, but it's not actually. <laughs> no. Now guilt is an incredible excuse. You know, guilt somehow seems um well, the excuse making seems to be this hill guilt, guilt trick, you know, like <laughs> you find a reason to blame yourself for something which is totally, if you unpack it often, it doesn't make any sense. You're not guilty for the suffering of other people or, mm -hmm. you know, your lack of uh, awareness. You, you know, it's like, it's like, it's a, it's a trick that, that puts you somehow, makes you separate from the world rather than connected with the world. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Can I, can I add to that? Because yeah. I'm currently going through a personal journey. I'm from Mexico, but I've been living in the Netherlands for the past year. And I'm going back to Mexico next week. And this uh, week during therapy, we discussed my anxiety of, uh, of going back home because I have worked very hard on, on my own self-care and what it means for me, for my context and where I come from. But sometimes it's difficult to explain it back home because these concepts are, especially when you come from a very communal uh, society where sometimes you feel really, talking about guilt, you feel very guilty if you don't give yourself to the others, you know? There is a, there is a very blur line or no line in between the individual and the community. So it was very uh, healthy for me to work on how can I, take the world that I'm living in back home and how to also claim those spaces for my own self-care so I can give back to my community. So um, yeah, it's very interesting that other people have experiences as, as well, because right now I'm going through the journey of claiming my self-care while being there for others. So I really like what Maud said about self-care is also not about you, but about others, more like community-based. Uh, and uh, it, it was really helpful to, to hear that. But I think culture has a lot to do with how we represent, feel, her this idea of self-care. Self and sometimes it's difficult to explain it to uh, in other contexts where it's more community-based. And if you are more individualistic, you won't be accepted by that community. So that's when sometimes I struggle. So, yeah, just wanted to share that. Yeah. I like to point earlier also, Shamukta, about how you your children might come in and how it's difficult sometimes to take time for yourself in a family. I have three children, so I completely connect to that. But in the same time, when and it, it connects to what you just said, uh, Amaranta, it, it's uh, uh, when when I meditate, for example, I do have in mind my children, my family, my community. And energies, we know now scientifically that energies circulate between people. So it will have an effect on them as well, a positive effect on them as well. But that takes a level of awareness, right? <laughs> you, need, you went through something to get to, to, to understand it and to be able to, to apply it. Well, I'm, I'm more available for my children if I take some time for myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and, right. um, I, I think that what Amma says is, uh, Amaranta has said, and, and, uh, and both of you, but, you know, all, all the people that commented now is exactly that. I mean, the, the quick, there's a perception, you know, we're very in, uh, in, in this, you know, not now, in the, this part of the world where I'm in now, in the Middle East, it's a very co communal society. Uh, and then, but then you have also um, a lot in, in Europe and in other countries. You have uh, you have this individual societies, but these are perceived. So self care, all these superficial uh, elements that I mentioned, uh, are very individual. They're not real self care. Self care is when we come out of ourselves. 
yeah, and really uh, look at how we connect with the world um, and how we engage and how we uh, interact with the world. If we stop and think about it or reflect or meditate, it's all our interaction um, around us. So it's, it's on the it should be really much more connected to, to, to everything we do and not rushing through everything we do, if, uh, if, uh, if we like. And I'm interested to hear, you know, is, do, is there a word of guilt? Um, is there, in, in India, do, is guilt uh, um, an issue? Sanata, you, uh, where are you based? Charlotte, yes, in India. Uh, yeah, so, uh, no, uh, since Sandra is also uh, spent a lot of time in Tibet, and uh, we are uh, in place where Buddha uh, spent a lot of his time um, gaining knowledge and then his teachings, and we are in between both uh, these important places. And I was thinking about Buddha, when we were talking about guilt and everything. Uh, um, and what I think is the, the way Buddha lived, it was uh, um, so much in harmony with surrounding, with nature, with people. So he was a born prince. Uh, he was born in um, Nepal and then he moved to India. And uh, the way he chose to live was so much in harmony, so much in sync with surround the possibility even uh, of uh, uh, guilt or any of such thoughts coming in his mind. Uh, what I think, I mean, of course, Buddha, Buddha can himself explain better um, had he been here uh, in our um, uh, Zoom meeting. But uh, uh, when, once we uh, get into, once we are dealing uh, with our uh, surrounding, we, uh, we lose the synchron synchronicity with the surrounding, then we have these thoughts comes up. Uh, we do have also, because we live in very, uh, uh, in humble surrounding and uh, there are some differences, but I think uh, feeling guilty won't uh, solve anything. Uh, uh, feeling, uh, thinking about guilt is not uh, solution oriented, but how we can, uh, how we can simplify our living and how, we, uh, how our living can connect and uh, get synchronized with the surrounding, with the people. Um, I think that's the best solution to uh, the, um, get rid of guilt and, uh, you know, and also we have to experience, uh, maybe there are some, uh, we are living uh, different than other people here in, in village. Uh, we have maybe more privileges, but then we can experience the pros and cons of uh, some things and then we can uh, bring what are the best uh, for our surrounding here. So uh, we can feel guilty about it, but we, on positive note, we can also think that um, uh, uh, the, uh, on the basis of experience, what, uh, what we can uh, uh, give back to our village, to our people, to children. So it's almost like but, it's uh, almost it is like important that guilt. It's almost like guilt is another uh, addiction. It's another excuse not to live harmoniously and to invest and be there with and be part of. Yeah, and factually when we think, uh, when, when we feel guilty is when we are not in sync with nature or surrounding or anything. When there is disharmony, when there is um, uh, less synchronicity between these, ourselves, our living and our surrounding, uh, chances of uh, guilt coming up. When we think everything, then the the connection is a little bit broken, uh, so that's so we can't hear you so well. Yeah. Right, the Sandra, more we are in sync with our surrounding. Yeah. More, the more we, we try to bring ourselves in sync with our surrounding, with nature, with area, with the with people, uh, 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 there will be less chances of guilt or any of such thoughts coming in our minds. Yes, yes, beautiful. I think this is clearly uh, 
some a, a theme that is emerging. Uh, I would say like self-care is almost like a misnomer or it's a misleading term because we don't talk about self in a narrow sense. We talk about the, our interconnectedness mm -hmm. with the world, right? The harmony with the world, right? with our family, with our, you know, our, our colleagues. Yes. And as long as we take care of ourselves, we actually take care of them as well. It's not, it's, it, it's the bigger self, I think, that, that Siegel yes. is referring to. So the word self-care is a completely yeah. wrong word in a way. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing to do with the small self. It has to do with something for, of term that we don't have. In Africa, no. they talk about Ubuntu. It's something like that, right? Or, you know, we, we, are, we are because, you know, I am because we are. Something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah thank you. So I, I, I love that emerging theme about uh, self-care and being caring for the web of life that we are part of, something like that. Um, but I'd like also just before we close, and I'd like to close with a meditation, but uh, just to make use of Chamatal's, uh, you know, um, presence here as, a, as, a, as an expert also, because we, with Garrison and, and, and CBR project in particular is, is in a way is provides training programs that, uh, that offer tools and practices to people, right? Because we have, experience that a lot of people, particularly in the West, but I guess in the East and Mexico, everywhere in the world, they need certain practices. Um, and of course, they run the risk, you know, of, 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 of being seen as, as quick fixes, but, but of course they're not quick fixes, but they are practices and tools. That's how we call them. So can you say a little bit more about the importance of these tools and practices in the context of this larger approach and the attitude shift of towards interconnectedness and the web of life, etc. Yes. So what we what we found, and particularly um, uh, in care profession, so uh, this is so in CBR, this is what we do. We care for those who care, uh, and what we found is that they're out of the sink. Yeah, they're out of the sink. So there's a lot of guilt and there's a lot of there's there's a lot of uh, of harm, self harm that is causing a ripple of harm, if you like, uh, within the teams, within the organizations, with for the beneficiaries, um, and and it just it's, it keeps going. You harm yourself, you harm others, you have you harm your work, um, and. There's a big and large discussion about the duty of care and how organizations are responsible to, to encourage people and create space for people to, to care. Um, and I'm not talking self-care only, but to care in general, a culture of care uh, and a culture of, if we like, compassion, the term compassion. Um, and what we are offering then outwards, we're offering this uh, tailor-made, and we call it tailor-made, not only in the, method, in the method of delivery, but also in the different solutions offered that are based on the individuals within that particular context, on the teams or groups engaged within that particular context, and for the organizations to, to create a platform to really create a culture of care, a culture of compassion, to increase their levels of compassion. And this is what we offer. And in this, we offer a cycle of the how do we apply this? How do we uh, go through these motions? And we use the CBR of the, the um, ABC of CBR. CBR stands for Contemplative Based Resilience. And through contemplation, contemplative practices, we strengthen existing resilience and existing compassion within individuals, teams, and organizations. And we do this through the ABCs. And the ABC tools involve awareness, and we go through awareness, um, opening and training techniques using contemplative uh, methods and communication and science. Um, and we then we go through balancing, taking this vast awareness that we all have and, and trying to understand and figure out how do we balance all this awareness, everything that we know. And we need to make choices. And once we make those choices, we need to understand how we integrate these into our lives. Um, and that's the last, the C, and connection. How do we connect this into our lives? Into our personal lives, between us and ourselves, into our social lives, be it professional or, pers or social personal life, 
and into the environment, environment that we work in, professional environment into the organization and also into the environment, natural environment. That's the final one. So we go through awareness, balance and connection, helping people, teams and organization to go through this process and really create a, um, a realistic uh, plan of action and a sustainable one that we can actually follow through and, and, and check in with ourselves and go through the cycle again and again because it's a never ending story and of growth and, and improvement. And this is what we, we do and what we're working on developing uh, um, ongoingly within the CBR project of Garrison Institute International. Okay, well, wonderful. And Thank I'm happy you, to Anna. answer any questions. Yes, well, an hour passes very quickly. So let's, uh, I think we need to close it. Uh, and I'd like to do that again through a silent um, or silent and guided meditation. So if you just sit uh, relaxed again, if you are, if you lost your relaxation in the, in the last half hour <laughs> because of the 